Well, welcome everybody. It's time for session four of the USC talks on uh, AI agents and robots with common sense. Uh, this session will be led by Sven Koenig, who is a professor of computer science at the Viterbi School of Engineering. So I'm just gonna uh, pass it over to, to Sven to, to, and let him lead the session. Yeah, so welcome to the session. Promises to be a very exciting session with four speakers. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Jonathan Grudge. He is a research professor of computer science at USC. He's also the director for virtual human research um, at USC's Institute for Creative Technologies. Now his research focuses on virtual humans and computational models of emotion. He is a fellow of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence in the Cognitive Science Society. He has won lots of honors. One of them is the Autonomous Agents Research Award from the Special Interest Group on Artificial Intelligence of the Association for Computing Machinery. And today he'll talk about modeling emotions. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Sven. And uh, I mentioned I basically represent a group of faculty over here at ICT that is interested in emotion, uh, including some folks over at the Army Research Lab. And of course, USC has incredible strengths in emotion research. We have Mayan Shri here, but also in psychology and business and health and gerontology. Um, next slide, please. So obviously, I mean, emotion has actually been implicit in many of the talks up to now. I mean, uh, Jay was talking about being happy about having your household. Um, and, you know, even though AI has not tended to look at emotion until quite recently, it's inescapable when you have to deal with human behavior. And so uh, wouldn't it be amazing to have machines that could actually figure out what someone really feels and then use that understanding to forecast down, more importantly, the downstream consequences of those feelings for what they might do in the world. Next slide. Um, when you think about emotion, it's actually important to distinguish two senses of emotion, which are sometimes confused. Uh, the first is that emotions are something internal to us. Uh, they, we report feeling them, they shape our beliefs and actions, uh, but it's really an unobservable state. Um, on the other hand, we ascribe emotions to other people. Uh, and so we see their expressions or actions and we infer uh, that they must be feeling some emotion and we use that inference to shape our subsequent behavior when we're in social situations. Next slide. Um, but it's really important to, to keep in mind that Perceived emotion is not the same as real emotion. In fact, people are really crap at inferring what other people feel. Uh, uh, but those perceptions, wrong as they may be, are what often drives people's actions. Uh, next slide. Um, if we turn to like theories of how people feel, um, the dominant theory is appraisal theory. And I say folk because there's actually argument as to whether this is truly how emotions work or if it's our common sense theory uh, mostly derived by from Western culture is how emotions work in people. But the argument is that emotions are a relational construct. They arise from uh, events in the world, but also uh, from our internal beliefs, desires, and intentions. And we use common sense reasoning to understand the relationship between that situation, uh, particularly the construal of that situation, because different people see different things when they look at a, a situation in the world. So how is that situation construed? And then they form judgments like, well, is this good or bad for my goals? Did I anticipate this? Uh, how much control do I have over it? Uh, who's to blame? And those pattern of judgments tend to be associated with different affective states, uh, but then also with different uh, coping responses for how we cope with the emotion we feel. So if we feel we're in control of the situation, we may take an action uh, to make the world better. If we feel we have no ability to control the situation, we may engage in wishful thinking or other kinds of uh, uh, cognitive shaping of ourselves. Uh, next slide. Um, the tricky thing here, the unfortunate thing for this kind of model is that means that much of what determines a person's emotional response is actually hidden. Uh, it depends on latent states like their goals, prior beliefs, uh, coping tendencies, personality. Um, and so mapping uh, between what we can observe and what someone might feel is quite complex um, and often can involve very involved reasoning. Next slide. Uh, so for example, uh, when you see a, a headline for this, um, this can evoke emotion because people imagine a nearby situation that might have occurred where Kobe Bryant just missed the top of the hill. And so just to highlight the very complex reasoning that can influence the intensity of emotions. Next slide. 
Um, but also uh, complications are often, we think of common sense reasoning in terms of propositions about the world, uh, but within emotion research, it's not just the facts, but in some sense, how vividly those facts are presented, uh, which evokes emotional states. If you read these two uh, sentences, Jack injured his hand or Jack caught his, ringer, his ring on a, a rugby player, which ripped his skin off. The second one, you would argue, might evoke more emotion uh, in you. Next slide. Um, but in fact, this image uh, probably evokes the most emotion of all, right? So really reasoning about vividness is important. Next slide. Um, when it comes to thinking about other people, uh, appraisal theory can be seen as like a folk common sense theory of how emotion works, works in other people. And people uh, can be shown to use something like appraisal theory when they're doing mental state inferences. So uh, they essentially try to recover the goals of a person by observing the reactions of that person in a context. Uh, next slide. So for example, um, Imagine you're playing a game with a person uh, and they've just helped you in this game uh, and they smile. So that smile in the context of that helping action uh, might lead you to believe they uh, value the goal of helping you. So they're uh, someone that you might want to cooperate with in the future. On the other hand, if you're playing a different person, they show the exact same smile, uh, but they do it in the context of harming you. Now that communicates quite different mental state inference uh, that perhaps this is a person that wants, you know, values exploitation, and maybe I should not cooperate with them in the future. So expression plus the context uh, helps us infer something about mental state. Next slide. Um, so how do machines typically try to reason about this kind of stuff? Usually work kind of decomposes it into two separate steps. One is given some person in a situation, how can we infer what their emotional state is? And then other work, given we know their emotional state, or we think we do, you know, what might be the downstream consequences of that for their subsequent behavior. Uh, next slide. Uh, so within the field of affective computing, most of the work I would argue uh, tries to do this by just simply ignoring the situation. Uh, so basically what you do is uh, get some data, you know, maybe from Amazon up Turk and what people think this person is feeling, uh, typically without any knowledge about the situation this expression was evoked in. And then you can train up a recognizer that would predict how they feel. Um, and this evidence that suggests this probably does not very, it's good at perhaps predicting what people would think someone is feeling from a decontextualized signal, but not so much about what this person is actually feeling. Next slide. Um, nonetheless, there's a lot of work that will say, take that learned model then and try to apply it in a different context. So show people a video of an ad and then upload the video of their responses to that ad to Amazon and then uh, infer that not only is she smiling, but she must be happy, therefore uh, our ad worked. Um, and a lot of evidence now se seems to suggest this is not a good uh, method for inferring downstream consequences unless the affective state is, is persistent over time, something like depression. Um, the alternative is to really try to dig in and try to reason about situations. And so a lot of my uh, early work is focused on how could we reason from descriptions of situations as to what a person might feel in that situation. And typically, uh, this is very knowledge intensive. And so we build planning models that uh, if you know this person's goal and you know the situation that uh, has just occurred, you can reason through the causal chains as to what, how they might feel uh, when presented in this situation. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so you could, for example, and, and we've done this where we uh, encode various kind of vignettes uh, into the model, and then we can make predictions, for example, about how someone might feel, including like who they might be angry at uh, in a particular situation through the kind of common sense reasons, reasoning that people do when they, when they see scenes like this. So in this case, uh, uh, somebody does something bad, but you actually would be mad at the person that uh, kind of coerced them to do that act rather than the actor themselves. Uh, um, so how do machines then could use this kind of situational reasoning to uh, infer downstream consequences. So basically, uh, a lot of the argument is that when people make decisions, um, they don't necessarily follow uh, decision theory, expect utility models, but they try to essentially maximize their expected emotion. Um, and so if you can, or their anticipated emotion that might result from different actions. So if you can predict how they might feel in different subsequent situations, then you can uh, essentially use a modification of decision theory to predict what kind of choices they might prefer to do 
uh, in an action. Um, how do we go forward? So uh, I would argue what we really need to do is combine those kind of two streams of work is to uh, reason about expressions that people reveal, but in situations. Uh, and in some sense, if you can have both, that can perhaps help constrain a better mental state inference than focusing on one of those modalities by themselves. Next slide. Um, just to highlight one, uh, it's hard because you need a lot of common sense reasoning to do it and maybe, and hopefully this community can help with that. But one very simple example, uh, moving in that direction is some interesting work by Decker Keltner up at Berkeley, where what they tried to do was uh, combine expression recognition with some kind of reasoning about the situation in which the person was in. So for example, they didn't exactly use AlexNet, but you can use something like AlexNet to extract uh, information from the scene to say, okay, they're, they're watching fireworks or they're in a riot or what have you, and that can allow you to be make better inferences. Uh, just to end with some complications, as I laid out that a lot of what we're trying to do here is look at situations uh, as separate from consequences, but uh, this is a kind of dichotomization which may actually not be valid. And so some recent work in effective science has argued that in fact, uh, emotion is not something in of itself, it's just a construct um, and that we need to have common sense reasoning to reason about that and how it varies across cultures. And just the last little plug is that if you're interested in emotion, we're running this conference next summer here at USC campus in July, where we're bringing together researchers from around the world on the topic of emotion. Thanks. Thank you. That's really a fascinating topic. I'm sure there are some questions. And so let me encourage the audience already to put questions into the Q&A box so that we can answer them at the end of the session. Our next speaker is Stefanos Nikolaides. He is an assistant professor of computer science at USC and directs the Interactive and Collaborative Autonomous Robotic Systems Lab. Uh, his research is on enabling robots to interact robustly with users. And among other honors, he received the uh, Best Enabling Technologies Award at the International Conference on Human-Robot Interaction in 2015. And he will talk to us about self-diagnosis of robot failures. Take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Sven, for the great introduction. So let me share my slides. So. Uh, Stefanos, I'll be advancing the slides. Oh, OK. Uh, sounds good. Uh, OK, give me a second. Start the timer. OK, so hi, everyone. My name is uh, uh, Stefanos Nikolaitis, and I'll speak to you about uh, self-diagnosis of robot failures. I run the Interactive and Collaborative Autonomous Robotic Systems I love, uh, at the uh, USC. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. And the topic that I'm uh, mostly focusing, I have been focusing on a lot uh, recently, is uh, how do we can enable robust uh, human-robot interactions. So how can we enable robots to operate uh, over large uh, timescales in uh, real-world settings with uh, real users? Uh, next slide. And so, and so an important element of uh, identifying robust human-robot interactions is how can we identify and account for undesirable behaviors? Next slide. And so the one example application that I will speak to you today is a shared autonomy. So in shared autonomy, the user has some goal and the robot uh, observes user inputs through a joystick interface and infers the user's goal and assists the user for some goal. And so in the next video, uh, what you can see is the user moves the joystick to the left. There are two goals, and what the um, uh, what, what the robot does is uh, because there are two goals, and the user moves the joystick to the left, it infers that the user wants to go to the T object on the left and uh, moves uh, through a constraint motion to that object. And this is a very very robust system. So we have tested this system a lot. We have uh, experimented with moving objects around. And next slide. But the question is, if we are to deploy this system and have actual users with disabilities uh, actually use that system, how can we identify undesirable behaviors? Can we actually find cases where the system may fail? Uh, next slide. And so uh, one approach to do that is, can we generate scenarios in simulation to self-diagnose failures? So can we try to simulate different situations and see where the system succeeds and where the system fails? Next slide. And so what does do scenarios mean in that context? They mean uh, joystick input. So can we simulate how users are going to provide inputs to the robot, but also object locations. So can we move objects around and um, see how the system will behave for different goal configurations? 
Now, the key insight is that scenario generation is a quality diversity problem. So if we try to formulate this as a single objective optimization problem, the result would be to find the maximally adversarial scenario. So where the human is completely random or deceptive towards a robot. But these scenarios are not very interesting. And, and instead, what we want to find is we want to find a diverse range of high quality scenarios, of challenging scenarios. So we want to find scenarios where the user is optimal, but also scenarios where the user is a noise, scenarios where objects are close to each other, but also scenarios where the objects are far away from each other. And so we formulate this as a quality diversity problem. And the state-of-the-art quality diversity algorithm is MapElitz. So MapElitz, what it does is it, it uh, takes as input to measure functions, measure one in this example and measure two. And these are the metrics that we want to have diversity for. So this could be how noisy the human, the human user is. And then it tries to fill in that space um, with uh, solutions that are diverse with respect to these measure functions. And also MapElitz, what it tries to do is it tries to find solutions of as high quality as possible. Now, the way MapElitz works is that it retains an archive of the best performance. So it keeps an archive of the best performing solutions. And then if you, if you go to the next slide, what MapElitz does is, is it selects solutions from the archive and perturbs them with some isotropic noise to generate new solutions and does this iteratively. So the key idea is that it uses existing solutions as stepping stones. And so we said, okay, MapElitz is a state of the art quality diversity algorithm. Can we use MapElitz to generate scenarios? And so we did this for the shared autonomy system. And uh, so one example scenario that you can see in the next slide is where that we found is where the user is very, very noisy. So this is an example where there are two goals. The user goal is on the left, but there is noise in user inputs that if we reproduce it in the real world, this can be some like jerk in the joystick. And then the system gets confused and goes to the white object. And that's not very surprising. I mean, if there is noise in user inputs, then the robot will get confused and think that the user is going to the wrong object. But what is really interesting is that uh, in the next slide, if um, even if for optimal users, the system find uh, a specific configuration of objects where the system will fail even for an optimal user. So this is an example where the white destructor object will be in front of the goal object that the user wants to go. And because the system uses a distance-based observation function, the robot gets confused even though their user inputs are optimal. And this is a very interesting failure cases that we had observed them, that we had not observed when manually testing the system, but it was uh, found automatically through systematic scenario generation. Uh, so one thing with MapElitz is that it selects solutions uniformly and perturbs them with some isotropic noise. But one question that we asked is, can we do better? Can we improve the efficiency of MapElitz? And what we did is we combined the archiving properties of MapElitz with then ranking a selection properties of CMAS, a state-of-the-art derivative free optimizer, where we used CMAS to search for the solution that maximizes improvement of the archive. And that resulted in CMAME, uh, which had significant benefits in performance compared to the state-of-the-art. And the second question that we asked is, can we generate more complex scenes? Because before we were just moving objects around. So what we did is we integrated CMAME with, uh, and we started searching the latent space of generative models trained with human authored examples to generate environments that match the style of human examples. So this was a, we did this in the overcooked game domain. And the, the goal was, can we generate overcooked environments, game environments that result in very different uh, coordination behaviors. So the next slide will show two example environments that were automatically generated. In the left environment, you have the two agents that uh, form an ad hoc team and they can coordinate very, very, very well. So you see both objects are very, very accessible and the two agents can co coordinate. In the right environment, you see that there is poor coordination. So you see that one agent has to wait for the other agent to come. The two agents get confused. There is a longer corridor. Uh, so you see here also there is some confusion um, on how to cross. And, and, this, and even though the two agents run exactly identical algorithms in both applications, you see that in the second environment, the coordination is much, uh, uh, much worse. And this in, these environments are intuitive, but they were completely automatically generated. Uh, next slide. And so uh, right now we are, in terms of applications, we are focusing on um, robot assisted assembly. So what happens, uh, so we have a system where the robot helps a user, but what happens if we start moving objects around and we change the environment? How will this affect the coordination behavior? And we, uh, then the other application is a robot hair combing. So this is actually in the next slide. So this is, uh, this is Nathan, who is also co-advised by Maya Batarik. And this is a demo that we did at uh, NeurIPS, but when everything was uh, 
in person and he has some uh, short hair so the robot will follow a specific path to uh, following his hairstyle but Yura in the next slide who has much longer hair uh, needs a completely different uh, hair combing strategy and so the question is can we automatically generate hairstyles and generate user behaviors to test the system um, and all these algorithms that I have discussed are open source. So in the next slide, you'll see that uh, we have a, a PyRips library that uh, uh, is completely open source and you can use to uh, use these algorithms and generate uh, diverse environments and diverse uh, scenarios as well. And next slide. And so the main takeaway that I, that I wanted to conclude is that uh, we focus on how we can make a robust systems and one approach of that is uh, through uh, by simulating scenarios and uh, what uh, we have been developing quality diversity algorithms and what these algorithms do is they can enable us to search for a diverse range of scenarios to, to find uh, and self-identify failures that would be all yeah thank you for a great talk um, and again for the audience please put your questions into the q and a box uh, we are going on to our third speaker maya matarek she is the uh, Chan Sun Xiong Distinguished Professor of Computer Science, Neuroscience, and Pediatrics. Uh, until recently, she was also the Interim Vice President of Research at USC. She directs the Interaction Lab, and her research focuses on socially assistive robotics. She is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, of the uh, Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and the Association for Computing Machinery, but maybe more importantly, she was featured in the documentary movie, Me and Isaac Newton. And today she talks to us about trust and deception in robotics. Go ahead. Thank you, Sven. Um, it's great to be a part of this particular group because I feel like we all so build on one another's work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about trust, deception and bias um, in human robot interaction. And this is work from, of course, the entire Interaction Lab, and in particular, great contributions by our undergrads, as well as graduate students. Next slide. So our particular work is in this field of socially assistive robotics, where the idea is that we use social rather than physical interactions to support human behavior, and in particular, uh, behavior change. Next slide. So we're really motivated by the huge problems in human health. Um, John mentioned some of the depressing statistics. This is a slide I've been using for 15 years and I just keep increasing the numbers. So that's quite distressing. On the other hand, there are huge opportunities for technology supported human behavior change aids. Next slide. And so what we're interested in is really how do we empower that behavior change through social interaction. We know this is a very powerful thing to do because we know in human behavior, change really comes about largely through social um, influence and pressure, which could be positive or negative. Um, and for this to happen, trust is necessary. But what we see immediately is that bias is omnipresent. So the bias is in the designer um, and introduced by the designer into the technology. The bias is in the design, in our case of the robot, but also the interaction, uh, because interaction design is a big part of what we do and what is now increasingly being focused on broadly. Um, it's of course present in the data and the models that we use. Um, and then interestingly, it's also very present in how the user responds to the robot. And so I wanna talk a little bit about some of these issues. Next slide, please. So. The fact that the robot has a body is complex and it's complex for all of these reasons that I list here, but specifically it's complex because everything about how we perceive it is already biased. And so let me uh, give you an example from a study that we did in the next slide. Um, so Nathan, the student that you heard about um, in uh, Stefanos' talk also did this work. Nathan is amazing, he does so many things. Um, so he did this interesting study looking at human perceptions of what should be an androgynous robot. And this is a special robot that we developed with UPenn, which is really built to be you know, intentionally androgynous and it's kind of almost human sized. And so the question is how can we you know, study um, human user uh, biases? And we looked at the multimodal um, presentation of the robot where the robot uses a voice and it also has, you know, this physical appearance and a, a small amount of movement. Um, and we find some interesting results. I mean, obviously you would expect that there would be bias. What's interesting is that it's not obvious how the different modalities influence the bias in human perception. So um, Nathan did a really beautiful thing of using a single voice and then modulating it so that it sounded 
traditionally male, traditionally female, and sort of in between, um, and then looked at how the voice overlays with the appearance. And we find that when the voice is androgynous, which is the case for most um, technology voices, right, most synthetic voices, then the visual appearance, and in particular clothing, really shifts the perception. And it shifts it towards task stereotypes. So for example, if you have a robot that's wearing clothes that are not really that feminine or masculine, look at those at the bottom, you still see that people perceive the robot as significantly more feminine. Um, and therefore, if you tell people that that robot is working in the medical profession, um, then people assume that, you know, if it's female, it's a nurse, if it's male, it's a doctor, right? So all of the underlying stereotypes that we see, we see reflected in some expected and then in some unexpected ways. So why do I bring this up? I bring this up because we have control over how we design the bodies and how we clothe, if we clothe the bodies and how we manipulate the voice and how we shape the interaction, but only if we're fully aware of the biases at all of these different levels. Um, let's skip to the next slide. One of the things that we're doing is trying to combine the physical appearance of the robot and added um, affordances, if you will, um, through the use of mixed reality. So the nice thing is that, of course, with a physical robot, you don't have full control over what it'll look like and certainly not what it'll do, but you can add augmented reality so that the interaction is still in the physical world, but there is this shared virtual world that augments it. And there too, you can, of course, very significantly influence um, all aspects of perception, bias, and trust. Next slide. So of course, the really interesting thing happens in the interaction itself. So far I talked about appearance, which is incredibly complex in itself, but then, you know, what happens in the interaction dynamics. So next slide. So I want to tell you a little bit about work that is really in HCI, not HRI, but it you know greatly informs what we do. This is work by Lena Mather, who is a graduating senior um, and just one of the most amazing uh, CS undergrads. What Lena did is she found a data set of uh, trial testimony. So this is real trial testimony of people. Um, and it is labeled for deception because, you know, people knew who was and wasn't lying uh, after the fact. So this is an interesting data set. And the first uh, line of work that she did was to look at modal, multimodal um, deception detection. And of course, what she found, and I say of course, because this is now increasingly evident from various domains, is that, of course, multimodal data are better when properly analyzed, they're better at um, allowing us to classify and detect. So with deception, for example, using facial affect data improves our ability to detect when people are being deceptive. Again, this is important because, you know, in case you didn't know, the human ability to detect deception is extremely poor. We're basically a chance. Um, and this is true for highly trained people as well. So people want to talk about like, oh, you know, people who've been trained on fax coding, blah, blah, blah. Turns out not so much. As humans, we're terrible at detecting lying. And we also have a bias towards believing things. Um, so anyway, on the next slide, you see the next thing that Lena did, which is, um, the, I think, the really interesting bit, which is using unsupervised transfer learning between a, a deception data set that was low stakes meaning that people were not actually lying, they were just pretending to lie. And then using that in order to train, to detect in an unsupervised way, the data of uh, the actual high stakes detection. And the accuracy drops a little bit, but it's still very impressive. So this is interesting because we find that deception is in some sense stable. Um, and even though this data set wasn't cross-cultural, it'll be interesting to see. And in her continued work, she's looking more at cross-cultural um, communication because some things, are very culture constant and some are not. And deception might be culture constant. Um, another thing we've looked at is empathy in storytelling. Uh, we did a large study here at USC pre-pandemic in person. Next slide. Um, and what we found is that people are very biased, if you will, in how they will trust and provide empathy. And so when a robot talks about itself in the first person, people are much more likely to be empathetic than when it tells exactly the same content in the third person describing another robot. Um, and also people who feel that they have, hold this slide, and people who, okay, thank you. People who feel that they are expressing empathy um, actually are expressing empathy with their facial expressions, which is interesting because often when we look at human data through questionnaires versus functional human data, there's a really large discrepancy. So next slide. So what we find actually by building a machine learning model then on the data 
from what people say, where they look, and how they respond to the robot in the multimodal data set. Uh, we find that in fact the facial action units that people that are that are critical for expressing the facial expressions of compassion are very indicative of people expressing empathy, and they are consistent with their perception of empathy. Um, so this was interesting, right? Because it really points to the fact that it really depends what kind of context you're working on. And things are very different in empathy than they might be in deception, than they might be in some other context. Um, so this is something that John has said previously in other talks as well, which is how important context is, and yet something that is very difficult to study in a principled way. I wanna to skip to the next slide now. Um, one of the other things we've worked on and continue to work on is um, multi-party interactions where the robot is a mediator. Elaine Short in her prior work for her PhD here, she's now at Tufts, did a really nice job of creating a computational model for moderation. And there was, we talked about moderation in a previous uh, session as well. So the idea of moderation is a computational problem of resource allocation. And she was able to basically demonstrate computationally how we can um, find organizational theory results, right? So the robot can encourage people to all speak and that results in much greater cohesion of the group and people having increased trust, and then later on actually being less selfish. Whereas if you optimize for solving the task in the shortest amount of time, cohesion drops, um, cutthroat behavior increases, and trust is low. Next slide. And now we're increasing um, the, we're really looking at trust in this context of support groups. So now the robot, instead of just mediating a problem solving situation, is actually mediating uh, mental health support groups. Um, and this is a really interesting question, especially during the pandemic, because mental health has become such a major issue. And mediation is a very effective tool, but people don't have access to always have a human mediator. It's a high burnout situation. So it's very interesting to see what kinds of uh, robot um, elicitation of empathy and disclosure increase trust and improve the amount of disclosure, because the more disclosure leads to um, better health outcomes. And so I think my slide, my last, last slide is just again to pop us up a level to say that these interesting um, phenomena of trust, deception, and bias uh, have a lot of interplay and human machine interaction has tremendous potential to do good, but we really have to be aware of these biases and we have to study them, model them and understand them better. So I'll stop there and thank you. Thank you, Maya. You had really some fantastic and insightful full ideas here. Um, again, if people have questions, please put them into the Q&A box. Our last speaker in this session is Michael Pazani. He is a principal scientist at USC's Information Sciences Institute. Um, previously, he held a lot of tenured and high-level administrative positions at universities and elsewhere. So for example, he was the director of the Information and Intelligence Systems Division of the National Science Foundation of NSF. He, his research is on machine learning, uh, explainable artificial intelligence, knowledge discovery, uh, as well as recommendation systems. He is a fellow of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. He is also among lots of other honors received the Classic Paper Award from the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. And today he will talk to us about user-centric explainable AI. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. So this is a joint work with uh, Albert Shaw, a professor of radiology, and Severin Soltani, who's in uh, cognitive science. And this work has been funded by both uh, DARPA and uh, NSF. So on to the next slide where we describe the problem. So the problem I want to address is how can an agent explain itself? Uh, AI reasoning can be quite opaque. So the problem here is uh, one of these molds is cancerous. Um, how can you identify the cancerous mole? And uh, there are actually AI systems, neural nets, you can uh, uh, apply, you know, give it a set of pixels, it produces a probability that it's cancerous. Um, but it really, the real issue is, can you explain itself? Or maybe can you trust it? So to up the stakes a little bit, instead of having a robot comb the hair, would you trust the robot to do the imaging, identify the cancerous mole and remove it uh, all in one swoop? And I assume when you get the answer 0.93, you're not going to do that. So uh, people have been looking at how you can get the agent to explain itself. And there's a variety of techniques. You can manipulate the input and see how that changes the output. And then you can see what parts of the input are most important. 
or you can propagate weights back from the output to the pixels and identify which areas the, the agent is looking at. So in the next slide, we see an example result of that. So here's the solution that explainable AI, traditional explainable AI comes up with. It highlights areas in red that are important to the decision. The blue areas are less important and there's a gradation there. I'm saying this is the alleged solution because while well, I've seen PhDs in engineering gain insight from this, I've yet to see anyone in dermatology uh, gain insight from the uh, red and green and blue areas. So what, uh, so most of this talk, go ahead, uh, most of this talk is about what we should be doing and what we should be doing is not having developer centric explanations, but having user centric explanations. So first the approach is, why don't we study the explanations produced by experts? They have artifacts like journal publications where they explain to one another, or you can interview them. In medicine, there's a thing called grand rounds where they uh, go over examples with one another and debate what the issues are. And then should we develop explainable AI systems that emulate these expert explanations and then evaluate that on end users? Uh, so here's an example of a goal I have. I don't have a system that can do this uh, yet, but we're getting closer. Uh, but this is an example of an explanation that a radio, uh, I'm sorry, a dermatologist uh, would produce. So this is a uh, melanoma because it's got a non-uniform color and the borders are irregular. Regular molds are more spherical and uniform in color. So that's what we're trying to do. And indeed in a number of different domains. So if we go to the next slide, um, uh, the next slide on the top shows five examples from artificial intelligence explaining and the bottom are uh, examples from medical journals or bird guides or a website on how to identify cats. And in each case, there's uh, the AI system describes where it's looking, but doesn't really describe what it is about that region that's significant, where the uh, expert explanation, the user-centric explanation, uh, in addition to identifying regions, uh, identifies what particular feature of that region. Um, and, you know, with a variety of mechanisms. Uh, and again, I've been working with a radiologist, also working in ophthalmology. And uh, these are the natural explanations that people come up with. As an aside, I'm a bird watcher, so we're going to switch to birds soon and uh, show examples of classifying birds. So another thing that we've done is we've studied human subjects. What do they prefer in explanations? So we've showed them uh, a picture like this with labeled arrows describing important and significant features or bounding boxes or heat maps or just a textual description like this is a uh, bird with a black head and a rufous side with spots on the wings and a red eye. And then we've asked the experts, first of all, is it emphasizing the right areas? And all of them are actually emphasizing the same area but then asked, would they recommend using this explanation to help identify the birds? On the next slide, we see the results of the study. And in essence, the labeled arrows are the uh, favorite and the heat maps that are being used in developer-centric explanation, explainable AI are indeed the least favorite. So people don't see that it uh, emphasizes the right areas, nor would they recommend using it compared to the labeled arrows? Uh, textual descriptions are okay, but um, uh, again, labeled arrows pop out as being slightly better. And bounding boxes are actually better than heat maps in, in this particular study. So on to the next slide. So if we wanna produce explanations like experts, how should we go about that? And here is our architecture of a neural network that we've been using. In essence, it's you know your standard uh, convolution uh, convolution neural network. It doesn't really matter. We've tried you know AlexNet, BGG, all of them work about the same. But we're doing it in a multitask way. And what that means is instead of solving a single problem like is this a palm palm warbler or a yellow warbler, we have it solve a number of different problems all with the same architecture. So first, what family does it belong to? Is it a sparrow or a warbler? What species does it belong to? But then we also give it feedback on whether it has a long bill or an average length bill, oh, a ring around the eye, a stripe on the wing, a number of different features 
And by the way, you know, when you go last, you get to see what others have done. And I'm quite interested in collaborating with some of the other people who spoke earlier on uh, using those techniques to do explainable AI for emotions, for example. But let's move on to the, this. Um, so now what we're doing is instead of explaining why this is an American set, we're explaining why the neural network thinks this has a long bill and why the neural network thinks this has a wing bar. And it's again, highlighting the regions for these specific features and these specific features are important in the classification. But you can ask the question, why do you need the heat map at all? If you want a labeled arrow, how can you identify a point that's where the long bill is or the wing bar is? And in essence, you can just take the center of mass of the heat map and it's just you know a weighted thing like in a particle system. And so putting it all together, we're uh, now starting to do that. So here's an example of something automatically labeled where it identifies the class of the bird, the family of the bird, it's a shore bird, and the distinctive features that it has a wing bar and a very large bill. Working with our my radiologist co uh, colleagues, uh, we're also doing this to x-rays. In this case, it's pulmonary edema is the diagnosis. And there's things like parabronchial cuffing, which is an important sign of uh, pulmonary edema. And uh, reticular lines are another example. So we're starting to try to produce explanations much more like experts, and now starting also to evaluate them to see that end users prefer this type of explanation. If we move on to the next slide, uh, I'll tell you what we're trying to do next. And what we're trying to do next is introduce causality into this. So in essence, the heat map answers the question, where? What are you looking at? The labeled arrows try to answer the question, what? But causality gets it, why? So why is this particular bird a raptor? It's a large bird. It's got a hooked beak, sharp talons, and it feeds chiefly on meat taken by hunting. So first of all, it has eyes set close together so it can see things well at a distance as it's flying. It's got a sharp beak and sharp claws so it can capture the thing that it's hunting. Birds that are prey have the eyes set uh, further apart so they can see a predator approaching, but the prey birds look like, uh, like this. So where we wanna head to at least is getting into this uh, causality. We're not uh, close to being there yet, but I think we've made some progress on uh, this user-centric AI by trying to produce explanations that are like what experts produce and like what users prefer. So I'll end there, and I think there's uh, time for some questions. Great. Thank you very much for the inspiring talk. Yes, so this is now the right time for questions, so I encourage everybody to type their questions into the Q&E box. Uh, let me start out by grouping sort of some questions together that seem to have something to do with sort of the ethical implications of, of some of this fascinating research. Um, so it seems that all of the phenomena that you folks have talked about could be exploited. Um, you know, it could be used for, for, for good or also for, for evil. Uh, so for example, right, I mean, Jonathan talked about uh, creating and understanding emotions, right? Could that be used for, for um, influencing buying decisions of people on, on websites? Or Stefanos talked about interpreting human inputs. Could that be used to misinterpret human inputs on purpose, right? To give humans the blame afterwards um, for, for, for decisions that they really didn't make. Maya talked about stereotyping in the context of robotics. So what is it that robotics researchers can do to overcome these, these stereotypes? Um, and Michael talked about uh, explanations, right? I mean, could people create misleading expla explanations? Um, you know, again, that influence human beings. Uh, so maybe everybody could sort of comment on, on how can we use this research you know, for, for good and how can we avoid that this gets exploited by the wrong people? I can jump in and make one comment. So, so within the field of effective computing, this is very salient. In fact, the uh, uh, AI Now, which is a watchdog uh, uh, that recommends policy, their number one recommendation in 2019 was to ban all effective recognition research. Um, and I think it's actually important to make a distinction there um, between why. So there's two senses in which these things are potentially problematic. One is that they don't actually work as they're claimed to work, which was mainly the 
the claim of that report so that they show algorithmic bias or there's little, really little association between say a smile and whether you're happy. Um, but the other, I think more longer term concern is a lot of those address will be addressed technologically and we'll get better at recognizing and reading mental state. Um, and so the, the more problematic long-term is what if they do work <laughs> um, and, and what kind of ethical framework can, can you do to guide that? And, and I'd say there's baby steps like within IEEE, effective computing uh, and other societies, you know, they're trying to come up with guidelines, things like informed consent is an important one for terms of uh, manipulation. But I think a lot of the, the you know, the, the was it the horses left the barn in the sense that you know this has been used emotion has been used for hundreds of years to manipulate people through advertising through um uh headlines what have you and it's not clear that there are strong guidelines to control that now that we can kind of leverage but <laughs> Yeah, I would I would add to um, and agree with everything John said. I would say it's interesting in robotics because uh, having embodied machines around um, really catalyzes how be people behave. So you could see the worst in people or the best in people. We see people showing empathy for machines, you know, like robots in a in the best possible way. Um, and at the same time, we see people really kicking them and treating them, you know, in horrible ways just because of this sense of like, well, it's okay. They're, you know, they're not human, so I can get away with terrible behavior. So they really reflect, um, the, you know, the full spectrum of, of human tendencies, good and bad. Um, and, you know, that exactly, it's, it's left a barn. You can't change it. So the point is, how can we design these systems that would bring out more of the good and hopefully, you know, train us away from the bad? Um, and so this is what we look at, right? We look at developing, you know, developing robots that, help children identify empathetic versus non-empathetic behavior and, and try to understand what makes people behave more empathetically, right? So I think the tools can be used to understand and bring our better selves, but you know, it depends who's using the tools. It's a, like a you know, humanity old problem. Um, so I can jump in and say that explainable AI does help you identify biases or prejudices in your systems. Um, and for example, people have discovered that uh, the cancer detection systems for skin cancer don't work as well on dark skinned people because there are fewer dark skinned people, first of all, in the database, but also uh, the darker your skin, the less likely you are to have melanoma. However, the more likely it is to be serious or fatal when detected because it tends to be detected much later in dark skinned people. So now you can start to think about how you can uh, change the, your algorithm so it can detect uh, melanoma earlier in people with, with darker skin color. Stephan, I, I would just say this well? explanation is crucial in the sense that it's a, regulation operates over mechanisms. And if you don't know what the thing does, it's very hard to regulate it. And I just wanted to add that uh, I completely agree. So they these systems, uh, on one hand, they can, uh, you know, we have shared autonomy systems and they can understand human intent and uh, help people. On the other hand, uh, there are all these different ways that people can uh, use these systems in a malicious way. Uh, and I think one approach is, uh, I completely agree that explainable AI is a, is a good way to understand how, how, how the systems are going to perform and also some type of systematic testing. So when we systematically test the systems in the same way that you systematically would test the uh, a car in production, right? But in this case, you would need to not only assume that users will behave in a specific way, but you would need to account for a range of user behaviors, including malicious behaviors, and uh, try to understand what will be the outcome um, when this when people in, uh, interact with the system in this way. Yeah. So we have a number of questions that came in, and I'll try to get through all of them in three minutes. So we need short answers, I think. One question was for for Mike, um, and the question was. Where do you get the, the, causal, the causal information from? And also in the context of multiple task training, do you need to manually generate all those feature tasks? Uh, let's see. So uh, first to answer the question of where the causal information comes from. And well, uh, I'm not sure. I just got to ISI. And I think the answer is it comes from J. That is the knowledge graphs, et cetera, is where I'd like to have that causal information. And uh, the second question is, do you need to pro have the features identified? Uh, yes, in our system, and as we're doing it now, 
you need to identify the feature. We're working on feature discovery, but you don't have to identify where. You just have to tell it that this bird has a long bill without, say, putting a bounding box around the long bill, and it figures it out from there. Great, thank you. There was a question for Stefanos about the uh, diversity scenario generation, namely, how do you prevent the system from forgetting what it has learned already from previous environments? Yes, so uh, a point of, uh, of clarification is that the way we do diversity scenario generation is we first train a system on some data set and then we freeze uh, we freeze the agent and then we test the agent with diverse scenarios. We, so we have not yet integrated these uh, diverse scenarios into the training. But there are approaches on how to do that, on how to integrate diverse scenarios with training. And one approach is to have this type of Hall of Fame uh, scenarios where you have a suite suit of adversarial scenarios and you gradually as you generate more scenarios you augment the training set and you train the agent with a suit of different environments so that it doesn't forget uh, the old ones and the final question is for for maya um, there someone pointed out that keith darling's new book the new breed talks about robots being similar to our pets and animals and how does that affect the trust in these systems and how can we utilize that to our advantage so it turns out that uh, we see across both typically developing uh, populations that even kids with autism, that it really depends on how you see the technology. So it's not as simple as, oh, well, you know, we think of them as pets. No, some people think of some machines as pets. Other people think of quite unlifelike machines as absolutely alive. So for example, there, there are a lot of people in the world today who feel that they have quite a relationship with Alexa. Um, and they, you know, they trust it, they like it, they feel like there's something wonderful going on there. And for those of us who understand the technology, right, that seems maybe perhaps odd. Um, and then there are others who see the robots as like the scary shell that'll come and get you and they kick it whenever they get a chance. So it is not as simple as one size fits all. And that's what makes it a hard problem. As always, we have to personalize our technologies. We have to understand about the user individually. And then it's even worse because you need to understand about the user relative to their specific you know, experiences and biases and everything. And then when the user is with someone else or with a group, and which group is it? In group, out group, then behaviors change as well. So you have to study one-on-one, -on -one, you have to study multi-party behavior, you have to look at societal behavior. You know, There's no shortage of interesting problems when we introduce new technologies, but these are great problems to study. So that's unfortunately all that we have time for, but obviously sort of aspects of common sense in, in machines makes for a very, very inspiring topic as we have seen already looking at all of the talks and all of the questions that popped up. So I wanna thank all of the speakers again. I also wanna thank everybody who asked questions. And if there are more questions, I mean, don't hesitate to contact the speakers you know, outside of the symposium. And with that, let me close the session. So we'll have now a break, I think until um, 11 o'clock and then we'll keep going. Thank you.